Tuwadros II was Emperor of Ethiopia from 1855 until his death in 1868. His rule is often placed as the beginning of modern Ethiopia and brought an end to the decentralized era of the princes. Although Tuwadros II's origins were in the era of the princes, his ambitions were not those of the regional nobility. He sought to re-establish a cohesive Ethiopian state and to reform its administration and church. He also sought to restore Solomonic hegemony, and he considered himself the elect of God. Tuwadros II's first task after having reunited the other provinces was to bring Shua under his control. During the era of the princes, Shua was, even more than most provinces, an independent entity, its ruler even styling himself Negus, the title for king. In the course of subduing the Shuans, Tuwadros took with him a Shiwan prince, Menelik II, who he brought up as his own son, who would later become emperor himself. Despite his success against Shua, Tuwadros faced constant rebellions by stiff-necked nobles in other regions not understanding the benefits of modernization. He ultimately committed suicide at the Battle of Magdala, during the British expedition to Abyssinia. In the first six years of his reign, the new ruler managed to put down these rebellions, and the empire was relatively peaceful from about 1861 to 1863, but the energy, wealth, and manpower necessary to deal with regional opposition limited the scope of Tuwadros's other activities. Tuwadros II never realized his dream of restoring a strong monarchy, although he took many important initial steps. He sought to establish the principle that governors and judges must be salaried appointees. He also established a professional standing army, rather than depending on local lords to provide soldiers for his expeditions. He introduced the collection of books in the form of a library, tax codes, as well as a centralized political system with respective administrative districts. He also intended to reform the church but he was confronted by strong opposition when he tried to impose a tax on church lands to help finance government activities. His confiscation of these lands gained him enemies in the church and little support elsewhere. Essentially, Tuwadros was a talented military campaigner. The British consul Walter Plowden knew well the political events of Ethiopia during the 1850s and had foretold the rising star of Kassa the freelance warrior from Quora, when being crowned as king, Plowden described him as such. The King Theodorus is young in years, vigorous in all manly exercises, of a striking countenance, peculiarly polite and engaging when pleased, and mostly displaying great tact and delicacy. He is persuaded that he is destined to restore the glories of the Ethiopian Empire and to achieve great conquests, of untiring energy, both mental and bodily, his personal and moral daring is boundless. When aroused his wrath is terrible, and all tremble, but at all moments he possesses a perfect self-control. Indefatigable in business, he takes little repose night or day, his ideas and language are clear and precise, hesitation is not known to him, and has no counselors or go-between. He is fond of splendor, and received in state even on a campaign. He is unsparing in punishment, necessary in a wilderness as Abyssinia, at that time. He salutes his meanest, poor, subjects with courtesy, is sincerely though often mistakenly religious, and will acknowledge a fault committed to his poorest follower in a moment of compassion with sincerity and grace. He is generous to excess, and free from all cupidity, regarding nothing with pleasure or desire but munitions of war for his soldiers. He has exercised the utmost clemency towards the vanquished, treating them more like friends than enemies. His faith is signal. Without Christ I am nothing, the French explorer, geographer, ethnologist, linguist and astronomer Antoine Thompson Davity describes him during his stay in Ethiopia, Cassip passed for being 28. His face was more black than red. Like almost all Ethiopians, he had a slender body and seemed to owe his great agility less to his muscles than to his powerful will. His forehead is high and almost domed, his slightly aquiline nose is a common trait among thoroughbred Amharas. His beard is very light and his lip thin, George Wilhelm Schimper the German botanist had mentioned the following about Tuwadros. Theodore, the new king of kings of Ethiopia, was certainly the most remarkable man that has appeared in Africa for some centuries. At the date of his assumption of the regal title, 
Theodore was 37 years of age, of medium stature but possessing a well-knit muscular frame capable of ensuring any amount of fatigue, a noble bearing in a majestic walk, and he was the best shot, the best spearman, the best runner, and the best horseman in Abyssinia. Kassa Hailu was born in Quora west of Gondar, his father was an Amhara nobleman of the Quora district named Haley Georges Wuldiorges. His paternal grandfather, De Jazmach Wuldiorges, was a widely respected figure of his time. Dembia was part of the large territory known as Yimaru Kimas, which translates as, the taste of the honey, or literally, what has been tasted by Maru. His paternal grandfather, De Jazmach Wuldiorges, was a widely respected figure of his time. Dembia was part of the large territory known as Yimaru Kimas, which translates as, the taste of the honey, or literally, what has been tasted by Maru. This name was given to the territory because it was the personal fief of Dejazmic Maru. A powerful warlord, and relative of Kassa. When Maru died in October 1827, his fiefdom was given, albeit begrudgingly, to Dejazmic Hailu by the governor of the province, Empress Menon Liban Amid. Kassa was in line to potentially take control of Yimaru Kimas after Kenfu's death, though Kenfu also wanted to give the land to his own sons. When Kenfu died, however, neither his sons nor Kassa inherited control of the territory because Empress Menon Liban reannexed it under her own control. According to the Ethiopian Chronicles, Kassa's mother, Wazero Atitajeb Wundawasan, was from Gondar and belonged to a noble family. However, according to Hormuzd Rassan, she was originally from Amhara Sayant. Her mother, Wazero Tizhal, was a member of a noble family of Begemder, while her paternal grandfather, Ras Wadajo, was a powerful and highly influential figure. It is thought that Tuwadros II's paternal side of the family carried with it a slim margin of Solomonic pedigree, however insignificant it proved when compared to the more prominently illustrious ancestries of some of his highborn rivals. Tuwadros, in his reign, indeed claimed that his father was descended from Emperor Fazilides by way of a daughter. When Kassa was very young, his parents divorced and Wazero Atitajeb moved back to Gondar taking her son with her. Not long after their departure, however, news reached them that Kassa's father had died. Popular legend states that Kassa's paternal relatives split up the entire paternal inheritance, leaving young Kassa and his mother with nothing and in very dire circumstances financially. In hard times, his enemies came up with a rumor that she was reduced to selling Kasso, a claim for which Kassa would go on to imprison Henry Aaron Stern for publishing during his reign. There is actually no evidence that Wazero Atitajev was ever a Kasso seller, and several writers such as Paolo's No No have stated outright that it was a false rumor spread by her detractors. Evidence indicates that Wazero Atitajev was fairly well-to-do, and indeed had inherited considerable land holdings from her own illustrious relatives from which to lead a comfortable life. Kassa's youth was probably not lived lavishly, but he was far from a pauper. Kassa was sent to school at the convent of Tekla Hamanot, between Gondar and Lake Tana. He took refuge when it was sacked by a defeated Dejazmach Wook, who by burning and dismembering the children, took vengeance on their victorious parents. Kassa escaped and fled to the protection of his kinsman, Dejazmak Kenfu Hailu, probably his uncle, but believed to be his half-brother. He continued his formal education and became familiar with the Bible and Ethiopian literature. He also received instruction on the techniques of Ethiopian warfare from Kenfu. When Kenfu died, and his two sons were defeated by another Dajazmak, Earl, Dajazmak Gashu of Damit and Gajam, Kassa was forced to make another start in life, and offered his services to Gashu. Kassa Hailu was born into a country rife with civil war, and he defeated many regional noblemen and princes before becoming emperor during time known as the Zemin Mesafint or Age of the Princes. During this era, regional princes, and noble lords of diverse ethnic and religious backgrounds vied with each other for power and control of the Gondarin Emperor. A puppet emperor of the Solomonic dynasty was enthroned in Gondar by one nobleman, only to be dethroned and replaced by another member of the imperial dynasty when a different regional prince was able to seize Gondar and the reins of power. Regions such as Gajam and Shua were ruled by their own branches of the imperial dynasty and in Shua, 
the local prince went as far as assuming the title of king. In Wallo, competing royal powerful Aramo and Muslim dynasties also vied for power. Nevertheless, a semblance of order and unity was maintained in northern Ethiopia during the era of the princes by the powerful races of the Rashik dynasty of Wallo such as Ras Ali the Great and Ras Guxa who controlled Gondar and the emperor, Kassa began his career in this era as a shifta, outlaw, but after amassing a sizable force of followers, was able to not only restore himself to his father's previous fiefdom of Quora but was able to control all of Dembiya. Moreover, he gained popular support by his benevolent treatment of the inhabitants in the areas he controlled, according to Sven Rubinson. Kassa shared out captured grain and money to the peasants in Quora and told them to buy hose and plant. This garnered notice of the nobleman in control of Gondar, Ras Ali II of Yeju of Wallo. Empress Menon Liben Amid, wife of Emperor Johannes the Secondi, and the mother of Ras Ali, arranged for Kassa to marry her granddaughter, Tuabek Ali. She awarded him all of Ye Meru Kimas in the hopes of binding him firmly to her son and herself. When he became too powerful to ignore, as a way to deal with him without using force, he was named Dajismak of Quora and given the hand of Taubak, the daughter of Ras Ali of Begemder, in 1845. Kassa was very close to Taubak and devoted to his marriage but his submission to Empress Menon was short-lived. In October 1846, he attacked and plundered Dembia, a city located due south of Gondar, and in January 1847 he went on to occupy Gondar. When Kassa unoccupied Gondar later that year, Empress Menon sent an army after him into north of Lake Tana. Kassa easily defeated the army and took the Empress as prisoner. Her son, Ras Ali of Begemder, chose to negotiate with Kassa, he gave Kassa all lands west and north of Lake Tana and Kassa in return released his mother, Proudy and Rosenfeld 1982. 60. Incomplete Short Citation the reconciled relationship with Empress Menon led him to join up with Ras Ali and Ras Gashu Zaude of Gojum. However, when conflict re-emerged yet again in 1852, Kassa retreated back to Quora to re-strengthen his troops. In 1842 Tuadros invaded Egyptian-controlled Sudan from western Ethiopia, successfully capturing Metema. However, he suffered a major defeat in March 1848 at the Battle of Dabarki, effectively ending his invasion. The defeat at Dabarki led to Tuadros taking efforts to modernize his military, incorporating firearm drills and more modern artillery. Tuadros sought to unify and modernize Ethiopia. However, since he was nearly always away on campaign during his tenure as emperor, disloyal leaders frequently tried to dislodge him while he was away fighting. Within a few years, he had forcibly brought back under direct imperial rule the kingdom of Shua and the province of Gajam. He crushed the many lords and princes of Wallo and Tigray and brought recalcitrant regions of Begemder and Simeon under his direct rule. He moved the capital city of the empire from Gondar, first to Debra Tabor, and later to Magdala. Tuwadros ended the division of Ethiopia among the various regional lords and princes that had vied among each other for power for almost two centuries. He forcibly reincorporated the regions of Gajam, Tigray, Shua and Wallo under the direct administration of the imperial throne after they had been ruled by local branches of the imperial dynasty, in Gajam and Shua, or other noblemen, Wallo. With all of his rivals apparently subdued, he imprisoned them and their relatives at Magdala. Among the royal and aristocratic prisoners at Magdala was the young prince of Shua, Salamarium, the future emperor Menelik II. Tuwadros doted on the young prince, and married him to his own daughter Alatash Tuwadros. Menelik would eventually escape from Magdala, and abandon his wife, offending Tuwadros deeply. The death of his beloved wife, Empress Tuabek, marked the start of a deterioration in Tuwadros II's behavior. Increasingly erratic and vengeful, he gave full rein to some of his more brutal tendencies now that the calming influence of his wife was absent. For instance, after the murder of the English traveler, John Bell, who had become the emperor's close friend and confidant, the emperor, in revenge, had 500 prisoners beheaded in Deborek. Then, in February 1863, after defeating the rebel, Ted Lagualu, 
Tuadros ordered the killing of the 7,000 prisoners he had taken. Tuadros II remarried, this time to the daughter of his imprisoned enemy De Jasmuk Wub. The New Empress Tyrawerk Wub was a proud and haughty woman, very aware of her illustrious Solomonic ancestry. She is said to have intended on the religious life and becoming a nun, especially after the fall of her father and his imprisonment along with her brothers at the hands of Tuadros II. However, Tuadros' request for her hand in marriage was seen by her family as an opportunity to get to Jasmach Wub and his sons freed from imprisonment, and so they prevailed on her to marry the emperor. However, while the conditions of their imprisonment were eased, the Jasmach Wub and his sons were not released, deeply embittering Empress Tyrawerk against Tuadros. Already feeling that she had married far beneath her dignity to a usurper. The failure of the emperor to free her family did not help their marital relationship. The marriage was very far from a happy one, and was extremely stormy. They did have a son, the Jasmach Alamehu Tuadros, whom the emperor adored and whom he regarded as his heir. By October 1862, Emperor Tuadros' position as ruler had become precarious, much of Ethiopia was in revolt against him, except for a small area stretching from Lake Tana east to his fortress at Magdala, Ethiopia. He was engaged in constant military campaigns against a wide array of rebels. Likewise, Abyssinia was also threatened by the encroachment of Islam as Muslim Turks and Egyptians repeatedly invaded Ethiopia from the Red Sea and from Sudan while the Muslim Aramo tribe was expanding throughout central Ethiopia. Tuadros wrote a letter to Queen Victoria as a fellow Christian monarch, asking for British assistance in the region. Tuadros asked the British consul in Ethiopia, Captain Charles Duncan Cameron, to carry a letter to Queen Victoria requesting skilled workers to come to teach his subjects how to produce firearms, and other technical skills. Cameron traveled to the coast with the letter, but when he informed the Foreign Office of the letter and its contents, he was instructed to simply send the letter to London rather than take it himself. He was to proceed to Sudan to make inquiries about the slave trade there. After doing this, Cameron returned to Ethiopia, on Cameron's return, the emperor became enraged when he found out that Cameron had not taken the letter to London personally, had not brought a response from the Queen, and most of all, had spent time traveling through enemy Egyptian and Turkish territories. Cameron tried to appease the emperor saying that a reply to the letter would arrive shortly. The Foreign Office in London did not pass the letter to Queen Victoria, but simply filed it under pending. There the letter stayed for a year. Then the Foreign Office sent the letter to India, because Abyssinia came under the Raja's remit. It is alleged that when the letter arrived in India, officials filed it under not even pending. Britain had several reasons for ignoring the letter. The British Empire's interests in Northeast Africa were quite different from those of Tuadros. The British did not want to conduct a Christian crusade against Islam but instead to cooperate politically, strategically and commercially with the Ottoman Empire, Egypt and the Sudan. This was not only to protect the route to India but also to ensure that the Ottoman Empire continued to act as a buffer against Russia's plans for expansion into Central Asia. More so, as a result of the American Civil War, Deliveries of cotton from the American South to the British textile industry were cut off entirely, making the British increasingly dependent on Egyptian Sudanese cotton. The British did not wish to see a conflagration in the region which would upset the status quo. After two years had passed and Tuadros had not received a reply, he imprisoned Cameron, together with all the British subjects in Ethiopia and various other Europeans, in an attempt to get the Queen's attention. His prisoners included an Anglican missionary named Henry A. Stern, who had previously published a book in Europe describing Tuadros as a barbaric, cruel, unstable usurper. When Tuadros saw this book, he became violently angry, pulled a gun on Stern, and had to be restrained from killing the missionary. He then beat to death the two servants Stern had brought with him. Tuadros also received reports from abroad that foreign papers had quoted these European residents of Ethiopia as having said many negative things about him and his reign. Conflict with Great Britain, the British sent a mission under an Assyrian-born British subject, Hormuzd Rassam, who bore a letter from the Queen, in response to Tuadros' now three-year-old letter requesting aid. 
he did not bring the skilled workers as Tuadros had requested. Deeply insulted by the British failure to do exactly as they were asked, Tuadros had the members of the Rassam mission added to his other European prisoners. This last breach of diplomatic immunity was the catalyst to Britain launching the 1868 expedition to Abyssinia under Robert Napier. He traveled from India, then a British colony, with more than 30,000 personnel, a force of 13,000 troops and 26,000 camp followers. Which consisted of not only soldiers but also specialists such as engineers. Tuadros had become increasingly unpopular over the years due to his harsh methods, and many regional figures had rebelled against him. Several readily assisted the British by providing guides and food as the expeditionary force marched towards Magdala, where the emperor had fortified the mountaintop. The British force defeated the Abyssinian army at Aragai, on the plain facing Magdala, on April 10, 1868. With Tuadros' army so decisively defeated, many of his men began to desert and the emperor was left with only 4,000 soldiers. Tuadros II attempted to make peace. Napier responded with a message thanking him for this peace offering and stating that he would treat the emperor and his family with every dignity. Tuadros II furiously responded that he would never be taken prisoner. The British shelled Magdala, which killed most of Tuadros's remaining soldiers. Tuadros released all the Europeans unharmed but ordered 300 Ethiopian prisoners to be flung over the cliff. On April 15, 1868, as the British troops stormed the citadel of Magdala, Emperor Tuadros committed suicide rather than surrender, a modern commentator states, when Tuadros preferred self-inflicted death to captivity, he deprived the British of this ultimate satisfaction and laid the foundation for his own resurrection as a symbol of the defiant independence of the Ethiopian. Emperor Tuadros commits suicide, as depicted by the media. As drawn by Emile Bayard after an English sketch, he has been said to have used a pistol which he had used during fighting for unification during the era, though in reality he used a dueling pistol gifted to him by Queen Victoria and presented by Consul Cameron. Tuadros II was buried by the British troops at Magdala's Medhain Alam, Saviour of the World, Orthodox Church under the name of Theodore II. In 2019 the National Army Museum announced the return to Ethiopia of a lock of Tuadros' hair, taken after his death in battle. Magdala was in the territory of the Muslim Aramo tribes who had long before taken it from the Amhara people, however Tuadros had won it back from them some years earlier. Two rival Aramos queens, Workate and Mastiat, had both allied themselves with the British and claimed control of the conquered fortress as a reward. Napier much preferred to hand Magdala over to the Christian ruler of Lasta, Wagsham Gobiz. Because if Gobiz were in control of the fortress, he would be able to halt the Aramos advance and assume responsibility for over 30,000 Christian refugees from Tuadros's camp. Yet as Gobiz was unresponsive to these overtures, much preferring to acquire Tuadros's cannons, and the two Aramo queens could not reach an arrangement, Napier decided to destroy the fortress. After a thorough medical examination which confirmed Tuadros's death as the result of suicide, the body was dressed and laid out in a hut. By the request of the emperor's widow, the body was later buried in the church. After Tuadros has been buried, Napier allowed his troops to loot the citadel as a punitive measure, according to historian Richard Pankhurst, 15 elephants and almost 200 mules were required to carry away the booty. These became dispersed in museums and state collections across Europe, though some looted artifacts have been returned to Ethiopia. Tuadros II's family later moved the emperor's remains to the Mahadir Selassie Monastery in his native Quora, where they remain to this day. Tuadros had asked his wife, the Empress Tyrawerk Wub, in the event of his death, to put his son, Prince Alamehu, under the protection of the British. This decision was apparently made in fear that his life would be taken by any aspirant for the Empire of Abyssinia. In accordance with these wishes, Alamehu was taken to London where he was presented to Queen Victoria, who took a liking to the young boy. Alamehu later studied at Cheltenham College, the Rugby School and the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. However, both the Queen and Napier were later concerned with the subsequent development of the young prince who became increasingly lonely, unhappy, and depressed during this time. 
In 1879, the prince died at the age of 19. He was buried near the Royal Chapel in Windsor with a funeral plaque placed to his memory by Queen Victoria. On a curious side note, many of the hostages were unhappy with Napier's demand that they leave the country. Several hostages argued that they had long since become alienated from their old homeland in Europe and would no longer have any chance of building a new life for their families there. The German observer Joseph Bechtinger, who accompanied the expedition, wrote, most of them, instead of thanking Providence for their final rescue, were not all happy with the new turn of events. They were indignant, upset, at having to leave Abyssinia. What, they said, are we supposed to do in Europe now, what are we supposed to do now with our wives and children back in our homeland, which has become alien to us? How are we supposed to live now among people who have become alien to us and whom we no longer like? What are we supposed to live on? Bechtinger reported that many of them eventually returned to their adopted country from Suez by way of Massawa. Following some short squabbles for the throne after his death, Tuadros II was eventually succeeded by Johannes IV as the next emperor of Ethiopia. The widowed empress Tyrawerk and the young heir of Tuadros, Alamehu, were also to be taken to England. However, Empress Tyrawerk died on the journey to the coast, and little Alamehu made the journey alone. The Empress was buried at Shellacott Monastery in Tigray where her ancestors ruled. Although Queen Victoria subsidized the education at rugby of Dejazmach Alamehu Tuadros, Captain Tristram Speedy was appointed as his guardian. He developed a very strong attachment to Captain Speedy and his wife. However, Prince Alamehu grew increasingly lonely as the years went by, and his compromised health made things even harder. He died in October 1879 at the age of 19 without seeing his homeland again. Prince Alamehu left an impression on Queen Victoria, who wrote of his death in her journal, It is too sad. All alone in a strange country, without a single person or relative belonging to him. His was no happy life. Emperor Tuadros II had an elder son born outside of wedlock, named Meshesha Tuadros. Meshesha was frequently at odds with his father, especially after it was learned that he had assisted Menelik of Shua in his escape from Magdala. When Menelik became emperor of Ethiopia, Meshesha Tuadros was raised to the title of Ras and given Dembia as his fee. Ras Meshesha would remain a loyal friend of Emperor Menelik II until his death and his descendants were regarded as among the highest nobility and the leading representatives of Tuadros' line. Tuadros II's much-loved daughter, Wazero Alatash Tuadros, was the first wife of Menelik of Shua who eventually became Emperor Menelik II of Ethiopia. Wazero Alatash was abandoned by her husband when Menelik escaped from Magdala to return and reclaim his Shiwan throne. She was subsequently remarried to Dejazmach Beria Paulos of Adwa. When Menelik II was proclaimed Emperor of Ethiopia at Wurilu and Wallo shortly after the death of Johannes IV, Wazero Alatash was among the first of the nobility to travel to Wurilu to pay homage to her former husband as the new emperor. Rumors persist that Alatash and Emperor Menelik may have rekindled their relationship and that Alatash found that she was pregnant by the emperor in the following months. The rumors continue that upon hearing about this pregnancy of the emperor's first wife, the childless and barren empress Tate of Biddle had Alatash poisoned. Yet a different version of these rumors state that she gave birth to a boy and handed him over to a friend to be raised as a common farmer in Shura. The eldest descendant of this line now resides in Kenya married to the daughter of a Jegna, some Ethiopians believe them to be the only legitimate heirs to the line of Tuadros II and Menelik II. Regardless of the veracity of these rumors, Wazero Alatash Tuadros, daughter of Tuadros II, died within the first few months of the reign of her ex-husband Menelik II.